Good morning, friends. It's good to see you again today. So thankful that uh, the Lord is faithful to each of us. Um, ultimately, in, in our forgiveness of sin and salvation and uh, future hope and glory in heaven, but also for the, the daily things like our health and strength and seeing you week after week come um, with joy and anticipation. I'm thankful for those things. It's uh, a blessing to me. And uh, it's a blessing to me also to come here and open the Word of God with you and ask, expecting the Holy Spirit to uh, work in each of our hearts and see um, that work evident in the week ahead of us. As normal as it may be for us in this room to come to a week, this building weekly and sing some songs and listen to a sermon, I'm sure that, that we each have people in our lives that would say, what do you do that for? That seems like a waste of Sunday morning. Um, but the, the question is easily answered in our minds, those of us who faithfully follow Christ. Why do we come here and sit week after week in this meeting and do what we do here? Um, certainly isn't habit or tradition or expectation, so that may be the case um, you know, from time to time and with some. But maybe more than these things, it's evident to you, you're aware of the value of this weekly gathering in your spiritual health. Um, and you've made some strategic and intentional decisions to have this be a part of your weekly schedule, hoping to actually see God do a work in your life. That, that is the hope of your pastor. Um, as we begin a new sermon series today, I want to introduce to you the New Testament book of Colossians, um, but I also want to ask you to solemnly consider why you're making the commitment to be here week after week in the first place. So um, this may be not your typical introduction to a sermon series. We'll get there in a moment, but I want to challenge you to think about this with me. Um, the sermon series isn't a series without preaching. <laughs> and so I want to ask you, why preach? Why preach? I want to read for you from Nehemiah, <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and that means he was standing in a podium. Um, and he opened it for all the people, and they stood. Now, I don't expect you to stand during my sermons, by the way. Although it wouldn't be wrong, but just, I don't expect that. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So Ezra gets up, opens the word of God, talks to the people a little bit about it. They say amen and worship. And then there's some other fellows that joined him, Levites, in verse 7. And they also read the scripture and helped the people understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read, these, these helpers, these Levites, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's a description of biblical preaching. To give the sense of the text. Why preach? So that you'll understand the word of God and apply it to your lives. So preaching, as we can see, at least in Nehemiah, has been the means of grace, at least from that time, we could go further back, if you'd like, and to Genesis and read in Genesis 6 how Noah did the same kind of thing. He preached. He preached to anybody who would listen. And so 
these that preached in ancient times were being faithful to God, expecting God's word to find its place in his people as God dispenses grace and benefits through the preaching to his people. So Paul told Timothy forward a few millennia, he told Timothy to preach the word when it was acceptable and popular and when it was in disdain and unpopular. He said, in season and out of season, preach the word. So it is through the preached word that the Holy Spirit addresses the issues of all of our hearts. Now, it's not uncommon for the preached word to be the vehicle that exposes the issues of the heart. In other words, you may not even realize that there are issues inhibiting your relationship with God until the preacher opens his mouth and begins to preach. You may think, oh, all is well on the spiritual front, and then the preacher gets up. If Paul gave this command to Timothy to preach the word, then it seems reasonable to us that we all need to be under the preaching of the word in order to be changed into the likeness of Christ. This is how, this is how God does it. In Romans chapter 8, familiar text to each of us, verse 29 and 30, Paul said that it is God's will that Christians be conformed to the image of Christ. And then in John 17, Jesus says something similar in his prayer to his father. He prayed that his followers would be sanctified by the word of God. And so God, his apostles, his prophets, his ministers, all are in agreement that the process of our sanctification begins and ends with the preached word. And so we preach. We sit under the preached word. It's critical to our spiritual development. It's just not a tradition. It's just not an expectation. It's just not something we do. It's actually God's ordained means by which you become like Jesus. So you're here week in and week out with much anticipation, asking the Holy Spirit to open your mind and heart to receive what it is that he has for you to do that transforming work. Absence from the weekly worship service where the word is preached severely impedes your growth in grace. In Colossians 3.16, you remember Paul writes, to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Why? Why is Paul saying Colossians? Why is the Holy Spirit saying Sun Valley Church, let the word of Christ dwell saturate you and dwell in you richly. It's because God teaches and admonishes his people that way. That's how you become like Jesus. The word of God cannot dwell in you richly if it never enters your ears and into your heart and mind. Oh yes, you can certainly read and study the Bible for yourself, but that is no substitute for having it preached to your ears and received into your heart in the corporate setting. The Holy Spirit works in a unique way in the corporate gathering of the church, and he has ordained that the preaching of the word in that setting is the primary means of grace in the life of each of his people. And so we come and get preached at. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any sword, and it does something peculiar. When it enters your ears, it begins to divide and cut up those areas of your life that need exposure. This is what we need. In our natural selves, we shy away from being exposed and challenged as the Word of God does to us. But the Word of God preached drives to the depths of the heart and applies soothing when necessary and healing when necessary salve. to that wounded heart. Sometimes you need that, don't you? You need an encouraging word from the scriptures applied by the Holy Spirit as salve to your heart. And then there are other times when you come here with a heart like granite and you need the Holy Spirit to pound away on that granite heart. 
I uh, hurt myself, which isn't a surprise to any of you. Um, I hurt myself once. I had a big slab of cement, it was, I think, six inches thick, and it was, I had it cut out, you know, um, by some concrete cutting company here in town, and it was, it was bigger than this pulpit. And of course, I tried lifting it, but that, you know, I couldn't even budge it. So I get my sledgehammer out, and at the time I had my, sh my right shoulder, which just worked on like a month before that, and so I used my left arm only. And I'm pounding away on this thing, and I pounded for 15 minutes. And it finally started coming apart. This, this big slab of cement got broken up into pieces big enough that I could manage with my left hand alone. But then guess what happened the next morning? Craig, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm all out of shape, all bent up. But the, it was accomplished. The, the, the rock had been beaten to pieces, and I could get it out of there. This is what happens in preaching. Um, you may get pounded and pounded and pounded upon, and it isn't until the next morning that you wake up and go, oh, my heart is softer. So when you hear the, the word preached, sometimes it, it needs to be applied as a sledgehammer to the rock-hard rock heart. heart. Um, because there are times when it is preached that it will run against your opinions. And you won't like it. Um, in fact, if, if you sit here week after week, month after month, and I always just feel chipper, um, then either you or I aren't dealing straight. Um, because of our sin nature, we all have natural resistance to God's word because of its penetrating nature. Remember, it divides soul and spirit. And, and so there will, there's going to be times when the preached word touches an unsanctified nerve of your mind or heart, um, and you will resist with different levels of intensity, uh, depending on the issue being addressed or the depth of sin that's been established in your life. Hence, the need for hard preaching, the, the need for the sledgehammer on occasion. John MacArthur, I've used this quote before, said, soft preaching makes hard hearts, but hard preaching makes soft hearts. And if you were listening to Josh Ryan last week, we need to pursue a soft heart with the utmost effort, right? The only way to soften our naturally hard hearts is to sit under this preaching that breaks the granite. And in case you think <clears throat> that granite illustration is mine, no, it's straight from the Word of God. Listen to Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word, God says, like fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? That's what God's word is intended to do. And so if you feel shattered at times leaving the building, that's good news. You know, I've heard people say, well, I get tired of getting beat up at your church. Um, I says, do you want something else? Really? You want me to just, you know, placate and apply little sugary things and make you walk out of here with some superficial joy that'll last about maybe 16 minutes? No. We're, we're here to receive the word preached to have its full effect. The next question is beyond why preach to why preach Colossians? Why preach Colossians? Even though this letter was written from a prison in Rome by a follower of Jesus Christ over 2,000 years, years ago, you're going to discover, if you haven't already, it's extremely relevant. Extremely relevant. Colossians, for the longest time, and still remains in a, a favorite book of my own, was the favorite book of mine. Going through Bible school and seminary, I, I absolutely loved Colossians. I lived there for quite some, not in the town of Colossae, in the book of Colossians. And, and by way of background, the, 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 the town of Colossae no longer exists, okay, so it, it died out in the first century. But uh, I lived in this book, and it was precious to my heart. 
the short letter that we're going to look at here for the next while can be read in about 15 minutes and it focuses on Christ as the answer to all of our questions. To, to be filled with Christ is the theme of Colossians. Does that sound good to you, Christian? But it, it, this, this wonderful short text answers our questions. So do you have questions in the arena of knowing God? How does that happen? How can I really know God? Well, Paul presents Jesus Christ as completely and fully God. So we ought to be able to study Christ, which Colossians does, and get a better understanding of who God is. So we need to get to know Jesus. So if you get to committing to being here regularly, you will know him much better in the course of this sermon series. I promise you. Are your questions about gaining knowledge, gaining understanding, or intellectual growth? Maybe that's your pursuit. Well, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 3, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Jesus Christ. You want to gain knowledge and understanding? Where do we go? To whom shall we go? Like Peter said, who else has the words of eternal life? So we're going to dig into all the hidden treasures over the next year or so that we study this short letter so that we will find Christ. And in finding Christ, we will find knowledge and understanding, wisdom, and intellectual growth. Maybe your questions are about religion or being fully satisfied in your spiritual practices. You may be someone who, who comes to church regularly, who does Christian things, and yet have a sense of dissatisfaction unfulfillment well you may ask to yourself after feeling this way am I worshiping the right way at the right church even with the right people maybe it's you guys you know these kind of questions come to our minds when we're not really fulfilled spiritually maybe some even seek some religious practice that Maybe that magic wand um, to that spiritual fulfillment you seek. Maybe you're one who just is tired of all the debates on peripheral things that the church seems so good at debating. Well, Paul said in chapter 2, verse 10, that Jesus, Jesus himself is the only one who will satisfy, the only thing who will satisfy so if we, can, if we can get to Christ, Sun Valley Church, these questions will be answered. Your, your, your spiritual hollowness will be filled. If there is a magic wand, it's Jesus. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 11, Paul just comes out and says it. He says, Christ is all. You, you wonder about things, have questions about life, about religion, about family. Listen, Sun Valley Church, Christ is all. Maybe your questions center on your identity. Have you struggled with your identity for some reason? What's it based on? What's your identity based on? Your looks, your health, your wealth, your intellect? Are you in constant struggle to be accepted by those around you at work, at home, in your community, even at this church? Do you feel like you've always been on the outside looking in? Colossians profoundly addresses these things. Listen to one way that Paul does this in chapter 3, verse 11. Here, that is here in the church... Prayerfully, hopefully, here at Sun Valley, here is not Greek or Jew, 
circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, we have a few of those, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all of us. We are all equal in Christ. Our identity is in him. And we'll get that into your head, either through salve or hammer. Friends, if we, if we do this right at Sun Valley Church, and I mean this, not, not this sermon series, but that too, but this, this practice of church, if, if we do this right, we should be able to live in loving and joyful harmony with each other, and everyone here will feel accepted and valuable if we can figure it out. And this, of course, according to Jesus, will draw all others to him. By our love for one another, by acceptance for one another, by our forgiving of one another, it's going to be not too long until there isn't going to be an empty seat in the room. Even if we had a third service. Here's another question that I'm looking forward to to working our way through as we study this book of Colossians. I think it's important to, to all of us in the room, can I really change? Can my spouse change? Maybe that's a more important question. <laughs> can Jesus really change me? Oh, I've heard the stories, yeah. Miracle here, miracle there, but what about here? Can Jesus change me? I mean, we each have some pretty ingrained vices in our lives. Can knowing Jesus do anything about that? And Paul's answer is a resounding yes. Yes. There is hope in Christ. If you are discouraged with lack of change or lack of evidence of the presence of Christ, be of good cheer and be here as we unpack Colossians together. Paul tells us in this wonderful letter that Jesus actually changes people. Evidently, Jesus had changed these Colossian believers substantially. Paul reminded the Colossians they had, that they had been radically changed, in fact. Prior to Jesus' work in their lives, they existed under the power of darkness. We read this earlier in the service. They were alienated from God and even hostile towards him. But Jesus delivered them from all that and brought them into the light through a relationship with himself. He changed them radically. At one point in their past, they had been wrapped up in sexual immorality, evil desires, coveting each other's possessions, and even each of them having many idols in their lives. And I'm not talking little figurines. I'm talking things that got in the way of Christ. Things that we struggle with today. Before Jesus, they were all committed to a self-centered, pursuit of personal enjoyment agenda. But coming into a relationship with him changed all that. They were changed into a people who were committed to his agenda, Christ's agenda who were bearing fruit in the kingdom of God and were fully pleasing to God and blessing to all those around them. Paul knew of the dramatic change that the gospel had in the lives of these dear people. So why not us? Why not me? We learn in this book that God changes us objectively. We are positionally changed from unrighteous to righteous. In God's view, you went from enemy to friend. Colossians 1.22, for example. God has now reconciled, or Jesus has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him. Talk about change. This is what a relationship with Jesus does. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, that thing that we existed in before we came to know Jesus, 
He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have forgiveness of sins. Objective change. Colossians 3.3, for you have died. Christian, you've died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's no longer in the hot pursuit of worldly allurements. Your life is now that you know him, hidden in Christ in God. Objective, dramatic change. Things also change subjectively. So this radical objective change that takes place in the lives of every believer also transpires subjectively. Bit by bit, little here, little there, he changes by, from one sermon to the next, our interests, our desires, our affections, our motives, slowly but surely seeing incremental change, sometimes at the speed of a snail, and yet change. We are in the process of being conformed into the image of Jesus, and it's subjective. Sometimes it's hard to see up close. But when you step back and take a broader perspective, you can see it. In this letter to the Colossians, we see subjective transformation taking place in the lives of those original recipients. In the same way that we pray it'll happen in ours. In chapter 3, Paul exhorts us to fight against anger. You got an anger problem? Do you, do you bust out at people that are closest to you? Well, Paul tells us how to fight against that. He talks about how to fight against malice, lust, slander, gossip, obscene talk, and lying, even white lies to one another. All things that you and I struggle with, they struggled with. Paul said we need to exchange those things that, that used to fill us up and, and instead be filled with things like compassion, kindness, humility, patiently bearing with each other and being quick to forgive. So we are to pursue loving harmony as a church which will resort, result in mutual joy. So this is what ought to fill us, define us as a church, as individual Christians out in the community. So can you look back over the past 6, 12, 18 months and see this happening? If you get back far enough, can you see it? Sometimes that's even difficult in the past 18 months. Maybe you have to go back a little bit further. Maybe you have to get someone else with better eyes to, to look at your circumstances. And they can say, yeah, I've seen it. So if Jesus Christ is actually at work in you, if he's transferred you from darkness to light, you'll be able to point to some headway, Christian. Are you more patient now, more kind, more loving, more tender-hearted than you were a year ago? Okay, two years ago. Not sure yet? Get, get a trusted friend and ask him the same question. That's what the Spirit of God does in the life of his people. He transforms us. So why are we preaching Colossians? To become familiar with Christ. You can say, well, I'm pretty familiar with him. Is there more? Last I heard, he's infinite. So there is more to Christ, even, then, even more than any Bible scholar may presently own. To become more familiar, maybe you could add that to your outline note, to become more familiar with Christ. Because I know that some of you are very familiar with Christ, which gives me much joy. But can you be more familiar with Christ? So how is Jesus going to change us? How is he going to answer these questions that I've brought up? 
through a more thorough grasp of Christ. Some of this is going to sound familiar to you Hebrews fans. Through a more thorough grasp of Christ. Do you have Colossians open with you right now? Open it to chapter 1. I'm going to read for you what we used as our call to worship this morning. And think about all that it's available to us just from these verses. I expect to spend some substantial time here in these verses. Speaking of Jesus, Paul said, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might have preeminence. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You don't even realize what you've just heard, Christian. And how substantial and infinite what you just heard is. And I'm not saying the sermon series will be really, really long, but we are going to talk about infinite things. Look back at verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him. And if you have a pen, by the way, bring a pen um, or some way to mark things. If you have one now, write and underline and for him. We're created through him and for him. Through him is just as important, but I want to focus on and for him. Just for a moment. Paul tells us that Jesus can change us because he's the one who made us to begin with. We can change because our Savior is also our creator. In verse 16, Paul reveals us a guiding identity. You ask about what your identity actually is, here it is. We were created for him. We weren't created for your vocation. We weren't created for our vacations. We weren't created for anything but him. So, friends, as we consider the Christian life and what we're going to learn from Colossians Take that gem with you. You were not only physically created by him or through him, you were created for him. Every moment of your life, awake or asleep, is for him. And I think without too much persuasion, I could tell you that these truths have significant implications on how we think and live daily. This short but powerful letter brings us all sorts of hope and guidance. It teaches us about Christian relationships. We're going to learn how we ought to think and act as husbands, as wives, as parents and children, employers and employees. Turn over to chapter 3. Look at verse 18. You're going to be underlining a lot in this section. Verse 18, wives submit. 19, husbands love. 20, children obey. 21, fathers don't provoke. 22, employers and employees respect each other. How do we relate to each other? The Holy Spirit tells us through Paul's pen. Jesus uses 
means, Christian, to change us. We are told in chapter 1, verse 18, that he is the head of the church. In other words, he guides and directs, orchestrates, manages his church. How? Through his pastors and elders. So God actually orchestrates local fellowships like Sun Valley Church. He directs his ministers, those elders and pastors, to shepherd his people and walk with them towards these Christ-like things that I've been describing. God's providence has you here at Sun Valley Church for some reason, and here is the primary reason, because he knows that the pastors and elders here are perfectly suited to help you in your spiritual journey. That's why you're at Sun Valley Church and not someplace else. Jesus changes us into his likeness by all of us being connected to this local body of believers who strain together in obedience towards God through his word and submission to his spirit. In Christ, friends, we will find that we have everything, everything that we need. And I'll have this on the overhead and I've copied the, the New King James Version because I like the way it reads. In Colossians 2.10, and you are complete in him. And all along you thought you were incomplete, lacking all sorts of things. Well, here Paul says, positionally, objectively, you were complete in Christ. So we want to become more familiar with Christ himself. Next, we want to be more familiar with Christ's word. Are you familiar with Christ's word? Well, you may be more than some other Christian, but can you be more familiar with Christ's word? Yeah. So write in the word more. More familiar with Christ's word. <clears throat> How are we going to get a grasp of Christ, a thorough grasp of Christ? It's got to be through his word, right? Uh, we need to be saturated by it. And many of you, by the way, have been reading and rereading Colossians in, in anticipation of this sermon series. And, and I want to tell you that's been a great encouragement to my heart. Um, but what a, what a wonderful book of the Bible to fill your soul with. If you've been reading this here for the past month or so since we encourage you to do so, I guarantee you these things that I've said the, this morning are resonating in your heart with much anticipation to what God's going to teach us as we lay ourselves open before the Holy Spirit and allow him access to the deepest crevices of our soul. <clears throat> the word of God, Christian, is foundational to our Christian life. And we are aimless and powerless without it. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Does it? Does the word of God dwell in you richly? Oh, friends, to be familiar with the word. When I was attending Multnomah School of the Bible uh, in 1978 through 81, one of the professors there was the founding professor, founding dude uh, of the university, and his name was John Mitchell, Dr. John G. Mitchell. A book's been written about him called The Lion of God. He knew the scriptures. There's two stories I want to tell you about him. I probably have told you before, but they're pertinent here. One is, before he began preaching you know, regularly, um, he was on a, a train going from Vancouver, British Columbia, all the way over across to the other side of uh, the continent, days on a train, and he was walking into a, a, one of the train cars and he saw G. Campbell Morgan, the G. Campbell Morgan. Uh, and if you don't know who that is, go look it up. He's a substantial preacher, substantial expositor, 
and commentator on God's Word, Gene Campbell Morgan. And of course, John G. Mitchell was fascinated with G. Campbell Morgan and read his commentaries, listened to his sermons quite often. And so he sat down next to G. Campbell Morgan and he says, hey, I'm entering the ministry. I want to know what the secret is. And G. Campbell Morgan, being the loving man he said, is, well, I'm not going to tell you because you won't do it. Get out of here. And he, this kind of thing. And about six or eight hours later, he comes back and gained his, his courage and came back into G. Campbell Morgan's car and said, if I promise you that I'll do what you say to the secret of ministry is, will you tell me? And he goes, yeah, sit down. And so he promised him and he sat down and he goes, before I preach any text, I read it out loud 75 times. Now get out of here and start reading. <laughs> Wasn't that abrupt, but uh, close. And so he began his ministry by that, and he taught it to us. And uh, in one of our classes, uh, Bible study methods, uh, uh, taught by John Kohlenberger, he, he said, okay, one of the assignments is you've got to read You've got to read 2 Peter 75 times, and 50 of those times have to be out loud. And so you saw students walking around the campus, you know, this kind of thing. And guess what? We knew 2 Peter. If you've read Colossians for the past six weeks daily, as was our encouragement, you've got a way better handle on Colossians than you used to. So that's my first story about Mitchell. My second is I was in a uh, freshman, I can't remember what it was, spiritual life it was called, spiritual life. And all the freshmen met in one room at um, some church. What was the name of that church up there on the hill? Central Bible. Thank you. And, and there was the, the entire freshman class was there in the, the class, required class, spiritual life. And... Uh, uh, I don't know how many were there, 300 or so, 500, and we were all sitting there. And he was, he said, okay, I'm going to be teaching you out of 1 John, open your Bibles to 1 John. And he, he opens his Bible to 1 John, and he begins like this, okay? You see this? Can you see this from way back there, Steve? Okay, this, this is upside down. And he starts, he starts going. Um, in the beginning was the word, the word of the God, and blah, 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 and we're just following along. And this is one of the times I'm rare, rare times that I was sitting close enough to the front to see um, what he was doing. And his Bible was upside down, and he was just quoting. The entire book. And... By the time I became a senior, um, uh, Mitchell was 94, I think. So he was 93 when I started. 94, and in the seniors class, I think it was Hebrews through Philemon or Phil Phil no, I can't remember what it was, Hebrews through Revelation or something. Um, and we were able to interact with him. We, we, got, we gained courage to interact with him um, and we were, we were asking him at one point, do you ever, how do you memorize the Bible? He goes, I never memorize the Bible, I read it. I don't sit down and go over my memory work. He says, I read it. I read it all the time. This is all I do is read the Bible. I saturate my heart and mind with the scripture. Hence, being able to quote the entire book of 1 John. He could quote the entire New Testament by heart. And he never sat down to memorize it. He was saturated with the word. So, friends, I want to make this repeated call to you to be saturated with the word. Why are we preaching Colossians? To become more familiar with Christ, to become more familiar with his word, and finally to become more familiar with with Christ's people. <clears throat> you may be thinking, I'm familiar enough <laughs> uh, with Christ's people. But let me, let me encourage you with this. One of the primary reasons 
or means of change comes through authentic relationships with Christ's people. It certainly comes with exposure to the Holy Spirit. It comes through exposure to the Holy Spirit in the Word, but it also comes through exposure through the Holy Spirit with Christ's people. God has placed you in a church. You are not a Christian on an island. You're a Christian in a church. And being authentic in those relationships is important. We don't just say Sun Valley Church exists to glorify God by creating an authentic Christian community. No, we say it intentionally because there is an important part of relationships that requires authenticity. We ask you to be in small group. But you know what? You can be in small groups and not be authentic and remain superficial. We need to take our conversations, even in small groups, beyond sports, hobbies, and mutually, mutual worldly interests. I'm not saying that sports, hobbies, and worldly interests are wrong. I'm just saying that if we really want to see lasting, substantial change in each other's lives, we must move beyond the superficial. We want you to join small groups, but if you do, and you should, go there with the purpose, with the intent, with the strategy of diving in deep and not withholding things that will make you look bad in the eyes of the people in that group, like a need. We must prioritize this transparency and resist all pretense as if all is well. Friends, I know a, a good portion of you, and I know things aren't well with a lot of us. So why do we come here with this pasted smile and act as if it is? We must acknowledge our sin and ask for help in defeating it. We must go to battle for each other, not with each other, and commit to mutual sanctification. So how does Jesus change us? He does it by means. You get preached at. And you have people in your lives that God has placed in order to draw you to himself. Anybody can be a great, great Christian on an island. If you don't have to interact with anybody, man, you got it. What a, what a wonderful thing. Right? People have said church would be awesome if it weren't for the people. Friends, the Holy Spirit saturates us with his word through the preaching of the word. He also puts us into a, a company of saints called church to see this authentic fellowship uh, rub hard against the, the, the edges of our spiritual life um, so that we will see transformation take place slowly but surely, like when you throw those rocks into the tumbler and after a month, they come out shiny. Friends, Colossians is going to be a wonderful trip. And I, I hope you'll be here regularly and do everything you can to not miss. Because the Holy Spirit will accomplish his purposes in us through this book, through this revelation. And I'm anxious to see what he does in your life and the life of this body. Let's pray. Lord, we, we gather together now uh, before you in prayer and admit that we prefer comfort over pressure and stress, but we also admit that we desperately need you, your word, and your people um, if we're going to see any progress in our spiritual life. So God, we, we want to remind each other and commit to you at this moment to open ourselves up freely in front of each other and in front of the Holy Spirit and call for help. 
ask for help, commit to pursuing Christ together. We pray this in his name. Amen.